on our islands. We know beauty carefully because we see it vanishing and fiercely because we know whose greed it is that ravages the face, the body of the land as we know as home. How young the body of our land is. How enduring despite storms and typhoons. Here the body becomes islets, becomes atolls that are either growing or shrinking. We now measure the arm of an islet with a tip while we mutter, hmm, and yes, this will do, this will survive the coming tides, it will have to. We mark and highlight studies and papers that discuss the length of our island's demise. Because we've turned our backs on our ancient guardians, earth, air, fire, water, they turned their backs on us as they begin to heal our mother. We walk in the grey haze of money puffed in our faces by the few present in everything, obscuring the paths we should take out of this crumbling world. The ocean laughs and asks, is it the world crumbling or is it we, amorphous and lacking definition? Why can't we protect you? Breadfruit trees that have migrated, the type of coconut our uncles say no longer grows. We shelter and cut and eat from your fruit. You protect us, so why can't we protect you? Do not forgive us. Whales, turtles, dolphins, polyps who create gardens of coral, until we have learned respect or gratitude for your mysterious presence, gratitude for how much we don't know, how much we can't manage. Do not forgive us, seagulls, pelicans, terns, till we have licked away with our own tongues the oil slicks from your stuck feathers and your beaks and the brilliant eyes. Do not believe us, our children, until the oil stays sleeping in the ground. Do not forgive us, our grandchildren until our words and deeds can break this global prison of profit we are locked into, can remove the rags and begging bowls of global poverty and replace them with the mother's riches, the common wealth which has been violently stolen by the few. Do not believe us, our great-grandchildren, until vulnerable words like homelessness and power-raving words like military aircraft are incomprehensible, are archaic terms that you have to research for you to know their meaning. Do not believe, do not forgive us until the carbon particles in the air all round you have transformed into twinkling white motes and shafts of sunlight, bright rose light and sunset miracles, flying fishes leaping across galaxies, a universe darting across reef flats. Our mother will heal, will be well, with us or without us. But what mother wants to heal and watch her children perishing? Do not repair this broken world, she says. It should not have been made. Make a new one, a world beyond the one that has been made so far. Make it. Four generations tall, four generations wide. Let us heal together. Wow, what a powerful way to start off our SIDS moment in December. Excellencies, distinguished guests, friends of small island states, everyone, welcome one and all. Thank you for joining us to commemorate this 30th anniversary occasion of Oasis. My name is Jabal Hassanari. I'll be moderating this evening's proceedings. And joining me in these co-hosting duties and representing the Aosis Fellowship graduating class of 2020 will be Ms. Brittany Megan. Thank you, Jabal, and welcome everyone to the SIDS moment in December. Aosis's reflections on its 30 year development journey against rising tides. That beautiful spoken word piece you just heard was the work of two fantastic artists from our islands, written and powerfully voiced by Mr. Kendall Hippolyte of St. Lucia, with contributions from Ms. Kath Kathy Jetnil Kishner of the Marshall Islands. 
I think it perfectly captures the themes of climate justice and protection of the most vulnerable, values that AOSIS has embodied so well over the last 30 years, and themes that we will continue to explore throughout this evening of reflection. Yes, and what an evening. We have a jam-packed event scheduled for you this evening. Before we really get into it, first, let me share a message to the AOSIS community on this momentous occasion by the UN Secretary General, Mr. Antonio Guterres. I send my warmest greetings to the Alliance of Small Island States and congratulate you on your 30th anniversary. Your exemplary leadership on the climate crisis has helped to move the entire international community to increase ambition and action. Your commitment to protect your oceans and harness the blue economy sustainably is essential to global efforts on biodiversity. The COVID-19 pandemic has exposed deep vulnerabilities for certain groups of countries, including small island nations. We need global unity and solidarity to address gaps and weaknesses and build a more sustainable and resilient future guided by the Paris Agreement, the 2030 Agenda, and the other great global accords of our times. Our reformed United Nations development system will work hand in hand with your governments to support response and recovery efforts. And I will continue to advocate for improved access for small island developing states and middle income countries to debt relief, fresh resources and concessional loans and grants. The United Nations is committed to bringing the special case of small island development states to the international community at every opportunity. I extend my best wishes to the Alliance of Small Island States for another 30 years of strong leadership and success. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you indeed, Mr. Gutierrez, and for your continued support and heartfelt advocacy on behalf of, this, on, on behalf of the special case of SIDS. It's, it's always greatly appreciated. So now uh, it's time for our first action item on the agenda, a retrospective of AOSIS. And to help us recap, and to help us recap the story of AOSIS, it is my pleasure to bring to the floor the Honorable Eamon Courtney, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Foreign Trade, and immigration of Belize. Minister? Good evening and a warm welcome to you all. Thank you for joining us to commemorate the 30th anniversary of the Alliance of Small Island States and to reflect on our journey thus far, battling rising tides. We find ourselves at a moment of environmental and cultural reckoning. What we do in the next 10 years will be consequential for present and future generations. For SIDS and vulnerable peoples worldwide, it will be existential. This is not hyperbole. These are the stakes. And make no mistake about it, this alliance we have forged here must be ready. We will continue to have to lead the way and be that moral voice to guide the rest of the world. So, we have taken this moment in December to take stock and answer three questions. Where are we? Where do we want to go? And how do we get there? As the cliche goes, you can't know where you are going until you know where you have come from. It is for this reason that we have decided to formally open proceedings with a brief retrospective of AOSIS, outlining the many obstacles we have overcome, how we have grown from strength to strength, and the lessons learned that we do well to take forward for this decisive period. This is a story, however, that in my telling alone will not be given the justice it truly deserves. Instead, we have asked the distinguished men and women who led OASIS through the key moments of its history to help tell this story. To start us on our journey, it gives me great pleasure to introduce His Excellency Tuiloma Nerone Slade of Sahmoa, who served as the chair of AOSIS from 1997 to 2002. It is a particular honour for me to be able to offer greetings from our part of the Pacific on the occasion of an event that is rather special in so many ways. 
This is an anniversary of 30 years of remarkable initiative and imagination, of common purpose and determination in the struggle, struggle in the name of humanity against the global danger of climate change and its consequences. From the very beginning, EOSIS has been dedicated to environmental integrity and justice, not uh, just for our island communities, but also for other vulnerable communities. EOSIS members had helped frame the precautionary and other fundamental principles of the Climate Convention and other related conventions, guided by the science. And we have been clear on these principles from the time I myself came on board as lead negotiator in 1994 and throughout my time as EOSIS chairman. With clarity, we have always recognized the need to balance mitigation and adaptation and more so the need for appropriate technology to be deployed and for financing to be provided to the most vulnerable of communities such as ours. Above all, I believe the AOS's countries have always been clear in their recognition of the critical nexus between climate change and the oceans. Much has been done and much achieved under the AOS's banner. But I fear there is much more to do the unfinished business of the Rio summits, fulfillment of the agenda for sustainable development, and to ensure success and reality of the Paris Agreement. May I express appreciation to Your Excellency Chairperson of EOSIS for your, your leadership and my admiration for the continued excellence of EOSIS advocates and negotiators. As in my own time, may I pay particular tribute to all our friends, partners and colleagues in civil society, the scientific community and other sectors for their generosity and commitment without which EOSIS simply cannot do what it is able to do. More particularly, I'm sure we will always keep in mind and close to our hearts those of our EOSIS colleagues, negotiators and fellow travelers who have moved on to grow old with the hills as the Mandiba did or have passed on. We all know and remember the distinguished Aosis stalwarts, the heroines and the heroes. Madam Chairperson, colleagues, this is an event of salutation and one of gained reassurance from the endeavors of 30 years. May I wish you all continued vision and strength to work for unprecedented solutions, solutions called for by our times and circumstances. Thank you, Ambassador Slade. Uh, I hope you're doing well. It's been such a long time since we haven't met. I do recall 2003 as you uh, uh, got elected to become a judge at the ICC, I had to take over the uh, chairmanship of the group. Um, in those days, as you rightly pointed out, it was quite uh, an issue for us to get any sort of traction on our climate change issues. But uh, we uh, certainly uh, kept that high in our priorities. And Ambassador Sopwanga of Tuvalu, who later became uh, Prime Minister of Tuvalu, uh, was the one who really devoted most of his time um, into, into uh, climate change matters. Uh, as you know, at that time, we also had to address issues of uh, uh, preparations of the uh, Barbados Plus 10, uh, and we had to have regional meetings in several parts of the world, uh, together with the inter-regional meeting in, in Bahamas. Um, all culminating into the SIDS uh, meeting in Mauritius where we had the strategy for the further implementation of uh, the Barbados Plan of Action. Um, uh, just before that meeting, as you know, we had the tsunami uh, of 2004 uh, where so much damage had been caused, especially to small island countries, that the profile of uh, the small islands became very high. Uh, a level that was never seen before. And uh, all we had to do then is to basically, uh, uh, it was much easier for us to be able to 
explain the vulnerabilities of, of SIDS. Uh, we also did quite a bit of work on trying to set up uh, our group in a more formal manner. And uh, we did a lot of work on uh, the charter for the uh, small island countries. And if we get Ambassador Sokwanga, I'm sure he will be able to talk about that as well. Um, so this is what I would like to say. Um, my chairmanship was followed by uh, uh, Ambassador Decima Williams, uh, and I would like to now give, him, give her the floor. Thank you, Ambassador Konjo, and warm greetings to everyone from Grenada. Alas, Copenhagen started off with the highest of hopes, but it turned into a bitter slog with little compromise between the developed and the developing countries. In the end, a political agreement, the Copenhagen Declaration, was crafted, but not agreed to, not formally adopted, and the climate talks were again thrown into a period of great uncertainty. But Eosis had captured the imagination of the world and had provided global leadership for climate urgency. So after Copenhagen, we regrouped and we tried again in Cancun, Mexico, where Eosis was instrumental in securing a review, a review process to strengthen the global goal to 1.5 degrees. And by a different tact, we brought the issue of climate finance back to the table by sowing seeds of a nascent entity that is now known today as the Green Climate Fund. The following COP in Durban, South Africa, was again contentious, like Copenhagen, before it, and it threatened to completely collapse. However, after nearly two days into overtime, and I must say the astute leadership of the South Africans, EOSIS was integral to brokering a compromise that brought the process from the brink and back on track. The way forward now included a comprehensive long-term agreement to be signed in Paris and to come in to be signed in Paris in 2015 and to come into effect in 2020. The leadership of EOSIS was also now scheduled at this stage to leave the Caribbean and to rotate back to the Pacific region under the chairship of my good friend, Her Excellency Marlene Moses of Nauru. Marlene is here with us today and I'm honored to hand over to her once again to carry on this fabulous ASIS story. Ambassador Moses. Thank you, Ambassador Williams Decima. Greetings, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to recount Nauru's experience leading this committed group of nations fighting for bold climate action. When the world's smallest republic took the reins of AOSIS leadership in 2012, my government was keenly aware of the capacity challenges it would face. The deadline for a new treaty had just been set and our race to Paris had begun. To reach the finish line, we would need to build for the future, which is, what, which is why one of our first orders of business was to create the AOSIS Fellowship Program. This innovative program has given dozens of aspiring young climate negotiators and practitioners from our 39 AOSIS members the opportunity to represent their countries at the United Nations. It is fitting that the UN now places a high priority on the inclusion of young people in its policy making. It is one of my greatest sources of priority that Nauru helped make AOSIS a trailblazer in this regard. The AOSIS Fellows proved to be invaluable to the group's efforts during one of the most intense periods of climate negotiations. We were now operating in a new paradigm, wherein all countries would be responsible for taking action. 
AOSIS had to redouble efforts to remind developed countries that they still had a moral responsibility to assist developing countries, especially the most vulnerable. Loss and damage in particular, an issue dear to AOSIS since the early days of climate negotiations, stood in danger of being seriously undermined. Loss and damage is absolutely critical to help vulnerable countries respond to slow onset impacts of climate change, such as sea level rise and ocean acidification and sudden destructive impacts like cyclones and hurricanes. And so the AOSIS heads of state that year reaffirmed loss and damage to as priority in the UN General Assembly, issuing a declaration that expressed grave concerns over the unique risks they face from unrestricted unrestric greenhouse gas emissions. The declaration helped steer the group's work at the 2012 climate talks in Doha, Qatar later that year. Working closely with the least developed countries and African groups, AOSIS was able to win support for loss and damage, even in the face of strong opposition from our developed country partners. This paved the way for a historic uh, year in Warsaw. Typhoon Haiyan had just struck the Philippines as COP19 opened, making visible to all the destructive potential of climate change and the need for an international mechanism to respond. Working diligently with other vulnerable parties and with the Philippines' chief negotiator, making emotional calls for action, EOSIS pushed hard for an agreement on the loss and damage. Critical to this effort was our hard diplomatic work to foster strong solidarity within the G77 and China behind our shared priorities. After extensive negotiations, the Warsaw International Mechanism on Loss and Damage was unanimously agreed. Veteran observers credited AOSIS with helping push developed countries far further than most believed they were willing to go. We turned over the AOSIS chair to the Maldives at the end of the following year in Lima leaving them with a consolidated negotiating text that entrenched our priorities of 1.5 degrees, loss and damage, and finance for developing countries. The marathon to Paris was now a sprint, but I think it's best if I let Ambassador Saria tell you this part of the story. Ambassador Saria? Thank you, Ambassador Moses. Excellencies, distinguished colleagues, and all EOSIS supporters. What a pleasure to say a few words as we celebrate the 30th anniversary of EOSIS. The Maldives had the honor of assuming the chairmanship of EOSIS in 2015. It was a critical period that laid out a number of frameworks of global policy. Drawing inspiration from the work of our predecessors, the Maldives strived to further elevate the issues that are critical to SIDS. Let me highlight five of them, or if you like, major landmarks of our time, in which EOSIS made significant headway under Maldives' chairmanship. First, we highlighted special circumstances and particular needs of SIDS in the Addis Ababa Action Agenda. Second, we laid emphasis on particular vulnerabilities and disproportionate impacts of disasters on SIDS in the Sendai framework. Third, we strive to ensure that the priorities of SIDS in line with the Samoa pathway were captured in the SDGs of the 2030 agenda and pushed for the highest level of ambition in the targets. Fourth, we expanded our advocacy to issues related to conservation and sustainable use of the ocean engaging in the BBNJ process, as well as shaping the outcome of the first UN conference on oceans. But perhaps our biggest accomplishment during that time was securing the 1.5 degree temperature goal in the Paris Agreement and a freestanding article on loss and damage. 
Of course, these significant achievements would not have been possible if not for the spirit of unity and solidarity that perseveres within EOSIS. Today, as we celebrate this historic milestone of our alliance, let's renew our commitment and raise our spirits to keep issues of seeds at the forefront of international discourse. Let me take this opportunity to convey my warmest greetings to Ambassador Louis Young, as well as the government of Belize, currently displaying courageous leadership during these challenging times we are facing. I wish the OSIS family great success as we continue our journey. May God bless you all. Thank you for the kind and inspiring words from all our former chairs who served OASIS so admirably over the years. Thank you, Minister Courtney and Excellencies for that inspiring recap. Now, everyone, we have reached the stage of our proceedings for the keynote address. This speaker really needs no introduction at all. A true Caribbean leader, She's a fierce defender of the rights of small island states everywhere. The Honorable Prime Minister of Barbados, Ms. Mia Amor Motley. Ladies and gentlemen, my island brothers and sisters in the Pacific, in the Indian Ocean and the South China Seas, and here, of course, in the Caribbean, most of us will be happy to see the end of 2020. The worst global pandemic for over 100 years has been joined with other unenviable records created this year, like the worst wildfires and hurricane seasons ever recorded. It has truly been an anno horribilis. Whilst we can look forward to highly efficacious vaccines for COVID-19 in the new year, there is no vaccine available against the climate crisis. Whilst this year has given us little cause to celebrate, we have come together to reflect on the 30th anniversary of the formation of the Alliance of Small Island States, AOSIS, the fifth anniversary of the Paris Agreement, and indeed the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. I'm truly honored to have been asked to share a vision of a future for small islands and the steps that we and others will have to take to get there. Imagine a world where size just simply didn't matter. I'm inviting you to imagine a world where the large, powerful countries and increasingly the multinational corporations did not dictate all of the rules. A world where the sovereignty of small island states was not simply a fanciful notion. A world where island people were truly in control of their own destiny, no longer subject to colonial or neo-colonial forces. Imagine a world that truly valued cultural diversity and the rich contributions that we as island people have made and continue to weave into the world's tapestry. Imagine a world that acknowledged systemic historical injustice and was reconciled to compensate, and I use the word compensate deliberately, those who have suffered loss and damage and whose development opportunities have been repressed systematically. A world where small islands were not considered dispensable a world where small islands were indeed visible. That is the future that we demand. The simple and undeniable right to live our lives with dignity in our own homelands. As we celebrate this 30th anniversary of AOSIS, the need to maintain unity within our diversity is paramount. We have achieved much when all 44 of us speak with one voice. You know it, I know it. We pushed successfully for the 1.5 degrees to be the guardrail rather than the two degrees. It was our lobbying that generated the IPCC special report on 1.5 degrees. Our constant representation has caused our special circumstances to be recognized both with the context of climate change and sustainable development from the Barbados Program for Action in 1994 to today's Samoa pathway. We are also the stewards of the oceans and lead the world in ocean conservation and the concepts of a blue economy. However, despite these laudable achievements, the challenges we face as small islands would force us to rethink, to reevaluate, 
how best we can collectively ensure our very existence. And this is 30 years after we predicted that this would grow into a full-blown climate crisis. Perhaps EOSIS should now engage the climate crisis on multiple fronts, in addition to within the designated United Nations silos. Climate change is both a human rights issue and a national security issue, and should be addressed in those areas as well. I posit, therefore, that most aspects of our foreign policies and trade relations should be coordinated and influenced by the existential threat climate change has posed. We should strengthen our internal capacities to generate and interpret our own climate data and to provide scientific evidence to our policymakers and negotiators. Strengthen South-South cooperation and dissemination of best practices among small island developing states. There is a significant body of work in this regard that has been undertaken by the Commonwealth Secretariat. For too long, we've spoken about a small island developing states network and the synergies and economies of scale that could be obtained by joint approaches to, for example, sourcing climate finance. Why can't we do that together? And this leads me to what I see also as the urgently required actions of the developed countries particularly in the context of this worsening pandemic. On July 31st, the United Nations independent expert, Mr. Lee, submitted a report to the General Assembly addressing the debt-related problems of developing countries caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. The report was clear and it was unequivocal. And I now quote from it. The independent expert concludes that debt problems, especially those of developing countries, must be addressed as quickly and effectively as possible in order to flatten the COVID-19 infection curve and to prepare for an equitable, resilient, greener and sustainable economic and social recovery." End of quote. Of significant interest to our small island developing states, especially those of us that are deemed as middle-income countries and denied access to most forms of official development assistance, based on antiquated and inappropriate metrics, the independent expert called for, amongst other things, sovereign debt restructuring and debt cancellation, an injection of liquidity into developing countries, a fresh allocation of drawing rights, and a wider vulnerability index to ensure that debt service does not undermine the enjoyment of human rights or the attainment of the sustainable development goals in all developing countries. Not only do I agree with the independent expert, especially on the need to review how we determine vulnerability, but I must say to you that this is exactly what we in the Caribbean community have been calling for since early in the year. GDP per capita is simply not an appropriate indicator. Through several intergovernmental processes dating back to a few de decades, small states have been consistently calling on the international community to integrate vulnerability metrics into their assistance criteria. Given the devastating impact of COVID-19, only recently have such calls taken on added significance and resonance, presenting a unique opportunity to change the development financing landscape for small states. And that is why CARICOM is working towards a universal vulnerability index that could rank all countries by their vulnerabilities using a set of agreed parameters. My friends, I would also recommend that, and Barbados indeed is lobbying for, the debt being incurred by developing countries, in particular small island developing states, as a result of the public health effort to fight the pandemic and due to the concomitant loss of economic activity, that that debt be quantified and isolated. That that debt, COVID-19 debt as it can be called, should then be refinanced at least partially through the issuance of special bonds with an option to accrue interest over long periods, for example, 30 to 40 years, indeed similar to the bonds issued during World War II. Many of our development partners are failing to live up to the promises they made under the Monterey Consensus and failing to provide the climate finance that was promised first under the Climate Change Convention and then indeed under the Paris Agreement. It is extremely unfortunate that due to the pandemic, 
scheduled negotiations have not commenced this year on a new collective climate finance goal for 2025. We need urgent action. We commend the efforts to date of the G20 countries, the United Nations, and indeed especially the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. But much more is needed and much more quickly. We need fresh approaches and new thinking. And that is why Barbados has volunteered to be the smallest nation to ever host a meeting of the United Nations Congress on Trade and Development. And that is why I personally have accepted the nomination to co-chair along with the Minister of Finance from Uruguay, the Development Committee of the IMF and the World Bank for the next two years. There is much work to be done and our survival as small island developing states depends on it. How can decisions about our future be made without us? The most vulnerable among us must have a seat at the table when major policy options are being negotiated. For too long, our voices have not been heard. As I said when I delivered the Raoul Prebish lecture in Geneva last year, we may be invisible to some, but trust me, we are certainly not indispensable. Now more than ever, there is a need for a financial architecture and a governance mechanism to mount a global Marshall Plan, to prevent vulnerable countries from spiraling downwards with ever-increasing debt in the immediate future, and to mount a green recovery to avert the climate crisis. My friends, I'm sure that you would agree that over the past two decades, confidence in the role of multilateralism has steadily eroded. This is regrettable and in no way helps the condition of small island developing states. As the world searches for something or someone to blame for the growing inequality, cultural populism is regrettably on the rise across the Americas, across Europe and Asia. The COVID-19 pandemic and the climate crisis are shining a harsh light on the existing fault lines in our global economic system. So what type of future do we want and are we capable of creating? In 2007, the Canadian author Naomi Klein wrote about shock doctrine, the exploitation of a disaster to push through economic policies when the citizenry was still in a daze and unable to resist. She used the term in a negative sense. However, perhaps there is a way to use shock doctrine in a positive way. The world has been presented with an unprecedented opportunity to reset, to reboot, to choose a more sustainable path, to acknowledge in the context of the climate crisis or in the context of reparations for the impacts of colonialism, that there are truly no developed countries, just wrongly developed countries, that must change, and developing countries that must avoid and adapt to the consequences of the mistakes made by rich countries. Klaus Schwab, founder and executive chairman of the World Economic Forum, has recently called for the Great Reset, which includes the creation of conditions for a stakeholder economy, the greening of urban infrastructure, and the harnessing of the innovation spawned by the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Let us make sure that no island, no island is left behind in the Great Reset. Now is the time to end fossil fuel subsidies for debt forgiveness and for the creation of innovative financial instruments to reverse the widening gap of inequality. Now is the time to regain our respect for science and our humility towards Mother Nature, to rediscover our common humanity and to build a new economic system. A system that does not rely on the exploitation of the world's most vulnerable people, nor indeed of the earth itself. A system that has as, it, as its aim, not unfettered, unsustainable growth, but rather one that facilitates the most elusive and worthy goal of all humans, the pursuit of happiness, balanced development. I truly believe that we as island people, as the custodians of some of the most diverse ecosystems in the world, as the genetic products of all of the world's major races, and the environmental products of centuries of living within our geographical means, we have a unique perspective and an ability to lead the world into a truly enlightened future. We have the ability to bring a human approach to all that we do 
because we simply do not have a buffer if we get it wrong. That is the very essence of being small. And it is the absence of that buffer that has caused us to trust ourselves and to trust our humanity more. We invite the rest of the world to equally trust our humanity to make this world a better place. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. Thank you, Prime Minister, for your inspiring and timely words. And now we would like to interrupt our program to feature messages from the heads of IRENA, UNDP, and the UNDRR, key partner agencies that have always stood with EOSIS and supported our cause. Director, please roll the tape. Dear Hall, I would like to congratulate today the Alliance of Small Island States on the occasion of its 30th anniversary. For three decades, EOSIS has represented the needs and interests of island nations. Its effort to shape the climate change and sustainable development agenda, including the formation of UNFCC, the Kyoto Protocol, and most recently the Paris Agreement, are commendable. EOSIS has been relentless in its call for greater climate ambition and the pursuit of a 1.5 degree pathway. As my good friend, the Honorable Wilfred Ellington once said, we cannot be silenced when it is our citizens that are on the line. ARENA, together with the intergovernmental community, recognizes the special needs and circumstances of SEEDS and has been a committed partner of EOSIS in this regard. Together, we have championed the importance of bolstering small island resilience from the front line of climate change. And it's only a result of a close cooperation with organizations such as EOSIS that we have been able to advance energy transformation and climate resilience efforts for SEED's community. I look forward to closer collaboration in future. And once again, I wish to congratulate you on your anniversary. Thank you very much. For 30 years, the Alliance of Small Island States has been a driving force and a global conscience for urgent climate action. The existential threat that we now face is something that islanders know better than most. Yet you are also leading the way through the Samoa pathway on everything from the blue economy to renewable energy. The United Nations Development Programme is with you on the ground in all regions and is proud to be a strategic partner through our SITS offer and our climate promise to advance the Sustainable Development Goals. That means working closely with EOSIS and we have done so for over a decade. I would like to thank Belize for raising the profile of SIDS throughout the chairmanship of EOSIS, including on finance and multidimensional vulnerability, and also to welcome the incoming chair, Antigua and Barbuda, whom UNDP knows well and to whom we pledge our continued support. Thank you. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for inviting me to join you on the occasion of your 30th anniversary. I extend my sincerest congratulations. EOSIS has been instrumental in driving forward disaster risk reduction efforts and advancing understanding of today's complex risk landscape. I and my UNDR colleagues are grateful for your continued political leadership. COVID-19 has been a forceful reminder that the impacts of hazards can cascade across borders and erode all dimensions of sustainable development. The systemic nature of risk, recurring hazards, and the existential threat posed by the climate crisis underscore the centrality of risk-informed development for small island developing states. Coherence between the Samoa pathway, the sustainable development goals, the Sendai framework, and the Paris Agreement is critical 
my team and I remain committed to closely working with you to reduce the disaster risk and to build resilience for the welfare of people and our planet. Welcome back, everyone. We are now entering the Talanoa format of our proceedings. To start things off and update us on the latest science is Dr. Adele Thomas. Dr. Thomas is a director of the Climate Change Research Center at University of the Bahamas and senior research associate at Climate Analytics. As a human environment geographer, her research focuses on vulnerability, adaptation, and loss and damage in SIDS. She was a contributing author for the IPCC's fifth assessment report and lead author for the special report on 1.5 degrees and is currently a lead author for the upcoming sixth assessment report. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Thomas. I'm Dr. Adele Thomas, a Bahamian and a climate scientist. I'm also one of the lead authors in the most important group that assesses climate science for the world's governments, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change or IPCC. Together with hundreds of other prominent researchers, I try to make sense of what the science is telling us about how our climate is changing and actions that we need to take to reduce climate change risks. But you don't have to be a climate scientist to see that climate change is already having severe impacts on small island nations. Here in the Bahamas, the 2019 Hurricane Dorian was the strongest tropical cyclone to affect our country in its history. With storm surges of over 20 feet, it caused billions of dollars of loss and damage and resulted in the displacement of thousands of Bahamians. Dorian is just one example of the increased threats that climate change poses for all small islands. Since the Paris Climate Agreement, the IPCC has produced three special reports with many key messages for SIDS, and I'll highlight three of them for you now. Firstly, small islands are already experiencing widespread and significant climate change impacts. Human actions have already caused one degree of global warming. Our oceans have become warmer and more acidic. We've experienced more intense marine heat waves. Sea levels are rising at faster rates and tropical cyclones are becoming more intense. We've seen increased coastal erosion and flooding and effects on key livelihoods such as fisheries. Climate change is already contributing to land degradation and food insecurity with negative impacts for the many small islands that are dependent on food imports. The second key message is that climate change risks worsen significantly as global temperatures rise. Every half a degree matters. The 1.5 to stay alive message that small islands champion is supported by science. The evidence is clear that risks of climate change are far worse at two degrees of warming as compared to 1.5, especially for small islands. With higher levels of warming, we face the complete loss of coastal ecosystems and significant risks to fisheries, tourism, and agriculture. Risks of multi-meter sea level rise also increase and some of our islands may actually become uninhabitable in the long term. As temperature increases, we run out of nature-based adaptation options such as coral reef restoration and may actually have to start relocating communities. The costs of adapting to sea level rise alone are estimated to be several percent of GDP annually for small islands. So even though we have been adapting to existing risks, exceeding the 1.5 warming limit may push us beyond our adaptive capacities. The last key message is that we need urgent and ambitious climate action to limit temperatures to 1.5 degrees. If warming continues at previous rates, we are likely to reach 1.5 by as early as 2030. Current emission reduction pledges are not enough and would result in warming of about three degrees. To prevent this, we need global cooperation to stop emitting carbon by 2050. Emissions need to peak by 2020 and then sharply decline. We need a speedy transition to renewable energy with at least 70% of electricity coming from renewables by 2050. The good news is that ambitious climate action has synergies with sustainable development. 
It contributes to improving food and water security and health conditions and also reduces poverty and inequality. So the messages from the IPCC are clear. We are already seeing the consequences of one degree of global warming. Every extra bit of warming above 1.5 degrees matters, particularly for small islands. And limiting warming to 1.5 degrees is still possible, but it requires unprecedented and widespread action, which can also help us to achieve the sustainable development goals. As a small islander, I appreciate and applaud the hard work and momentous achievements of AOSIS. Congratulations on this 30th anniversary of amplifying the voices of small island nations. Thank you so much, Dr. Thomas, for your words and excellently said. And thank you also for giving us this sobering reality check of the staggering ground that we have to cover in the coming decade, but also the message of hope that the mitigation of climate risk stands side by side with sustainable development and improved livelihoods for all of us, SIDS included. Yes, and to accomplish this, the political will has to be there and the world needs to accept and believe these scientific findings as dire as they may be. It is why AOSIS has pushed for the 1.5 degree report and why we continue to push for the report to be formally accepted within the UNFCCC process. Giving unexpected wind to our wings in this drive, we are joined by March for Science team, as well as the official youth constituency of the UNFCCC, Yongo, who organized a grassroots campaign around this rallying cry called Science, Not Silence. And here to provide us with an update of the latest announcements of support for the Science, Not Science, Silence pledge is Ms. Marie Claire of Yongo. Hi, Marie. Hello, and thank you so much. As already mentioned, as the official youth constituency of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, Yango has a vested interest in ensuring that climate action is not only informed by the next generation of leader, but science as well. That's why it has been heartbreaking for us to watch that the IPC 1.5 special report was blocked at COP24, as well as at COP25, from being formally welcomed. But fortunately, there has been a growing movement to unite world leaders behind science in support of the 1.5 report, as well when we are heading into COP26 now. In partnership with March for Science, the independent state of Samoa, AUSIS, Yango is proud to be an official organizing partner of the Science Not Silence campaign. We are calling on governments around the world to join us by publicly championing the IPCC 1.5 special report and pledging to vote for it to be formally welcomed at COP26. So far, we have already secured the support of 13 additional countries who have signed the pledge. Now I have to read them out, and I'm sorry if I do a mistake, but I'm trying my best. Antigua and Barbuda, Belize, Fiji, Nauru, Norway, Papua Nova Guinea, Republic of the Maldives, Republic of the Marshall Islands, the Seychelles, St. Lucia, Timor-Leste, Tongua and Tuvalu. We thank for your climate leadership and call on all other governments to please join us as we not only fight for our own future, but to redefine the success for the climate movement. Next Saturday, Yango is hosting a Sci Science Not Silence forum to commemorate the five years anniversary of the Paris Agreement and build momentum around the campaign and the pledges. If you're interested in joining us, please notify our partners at the OCs. And of course, we thank you so much that we have been that we have been speaking here and congratulating OSIS and the whole family for your 30 years anniversary. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Marie. And, and you heard her. Uh, please feel free to get in contact with the AOSIS team um, or Yungo for that special event next week. And definitely, Marie, the AOSIS membership has definitely always accepted the science. And although we have contributed the least to this problem, due to the urgency of the moment and under the most trying of financial circumstances, SIDS have stepped up to show the world what must be done and what counts as real climate ambition. So in this segment, we will highlight just three of these countries, one from each SIDS region, who has graciously agreed to share with us a little bit more about what their updated NDCs to be submitted in 2020 and the lessons learned during the process. So we will begin with Nauru and Minister Renier Gadubu, himself a graduate of the AOSIS Fellowship. And he will be followed by the Honorable Dr. Gail Rigobert, 
Minister for Education, Innovation, Gender Relations, and Sustainable Development of St. Lucia. And finally, the Honorable Mr. Abdullah Shahid, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Maldives. So let's hear from them. Excellencies, colleagues, friends. Let me begin by thanking the Chair of EOSIS for the kind invitation to participate in this event celebrating the 30th anniversary of the Alliance of Small Island States. It is an honor to be here representing the Pacific region and to share with you the story of our, of our updated NDC. During my time in New York, I had the opportunity to negotiate the SDGs and the Paris Agreement. Given this experience and the recognition that a siloed approach to sustainable development is ineffective, Nauru has sought to bring together both our climate action and the SDGs in a comprehensive way as part of our NDC. To achieve this inclusive vision, my NDC team met with an array of national stakeholders from government departments, state-owned enterprises, the private sector, and civil society to ensure that our NDC reflected the broad all of society approach that climate change action requires. We think this approach is advantageous because it ensures climate action is aligned with our national sustainable development priorities. It also effectively engages the whole of government, including ministries that do not always consider climate action to be within their armpit. And vitally, it improves the coherence of our efforts to access financial, technological and capacity building support. Colleagues, the overriding priority of our, of our government is to eradicate poverty and to improve the safety, security and quality of life of our citizens. To this end, Nauru's updated NDC has been aligned with national efforts to achieve the SDGs and is fully integrated with our national sustainable development strategy. Our updated NDC is a significant enhancement from our initial NDC from 2015 which was much limited in its approach and stated our general desire to increase our country's resilience to climate impacts through increased adaptation efforts and an overall desire to lower the carbon footprint of our energy sector. Our updated NDC enumerates specific targets and actions in seven areas identified in our national sustainable development strategy. These are productive land, healthy and productive people, water, food and, en and energy security, healthy environment and good governance. Only by addressing each of these areas will, will we be able to effectively address climate change in a comprehensive manner that is required. Colleagues, in addition, an eighth area of contributions and an area that EOSIS has championed over the years, which is loss and damage, has been included to address climate change impacts that exceed Nauru's adaptive capacity. Loss and damage is an area where a lot of energy and hard work has been done by EOSIS members, and in particular by Pacific women negotiators at UNFCCC. Other female negotiators have been instrumental in coordinating Pacific positions, leading coalition groups, and influencing the climate agenda with their wealth of technical, legal, and diplomatic skills. EOSIS has long been a home for some of the strongest negotiators, and in my experience, the wisdom, dedication, and toughness that the women of EOSIS bring to the table should be applauded. Colleagues, I thank you for your attention and for your continued support and engagement with EOSIS. It is only through our close collaboration in a spirit of unity and solidarity that we have achieved our gains over the past 30 years. And I remain steadfast in my commitment to EOSIS as we look forward to the next 30 years. I thank you all. It is my honor to convey greetings to the Alliance of Small Island States as it commemorates its 30th anniversary. Certainly, we know that the current circumstances we are living through call not for celebration, but for reflection, recalibration, and focus on the road ahead to better times. More sustainable development and greater collaboration remain core ambitions. 
I believe that the leadership team of AOSIS, current and incoming, and its many partners will help steer us through the challenging times. During the course of this week, I, along with fellow ministers of St. Lucia, were privileged to receive first-hand insights of the work being undertaken through the NDC revision process. The extensive stakeholder consultations involving the private sector, academia, and our youth, including the endorsement earlier this year by Cabinet of our climate change private sector strategy, the alignment of our NDC with sustainable development goals, and our recently launched national medium term strategy, development strategy, the genesis of a climate budget tracking tool, a recognition in the absence of mitigation ambition of the rising cost of adaptation and the possible limits to adaptation that may result in loss and damage, and further qualifying our climate action efforts by inviting partners in research through the new climate change research policy and strategy. These are some of the new dimensions that are guiding the updates of our NDC, which demonstrates our ambition as a small island developing state. We are excited about pursuing these new efforts, as they will not only serve to strengthen the interagency collaboration that we enjoy currently, but will allow us to pursue the continued implementation of our NDC in a more holistic and strategic manner. Moreover, the thoroughness of our revision process will also indicate to our existing and potential partners our readiness to receive further implementation support. Like many other countries, we are contending with the challenges that COVID-19 brings as we determine an implementation strategy for our NDC. Prudent consideration must be given to maintaining our ambition and building resilience amidst the social, economic, and health crises. Therefore, NDC revision efforts will extend to an analysis of the impact of COVID-19 on NDC implementation as we continue to plan and prepare for our recovery. As St. Lucia looks forward to submitting its updated NDC to the Conference of Parties during the month of December 2020, let me take this opportunity to acknowledge the stellar leadership of Team Belize while we welcome Team Antigua and Barbuda. We thank all of you for your unwavering support and wish for all saints good health and safety for the rest of 2020. I thank you. Madam Chair, Excellencies, Distinguished Delegates. The COVID pandemic should not halt our momentum on climate action. AOSIS must stand united in responding to the call by the Secretary General for a green recovery from the pandemic and the adoption of his proposed climate actions to shape economic recovery. Building back better is building back greener. The Maldives will submit updated NDCs in 2020. We commend the Chair's leadership in generating momentum for ramping up NDCs in our united effort to reach the 1.5 degrees target. At the same time, we must appeal to our partners in the developed world to provide adequate, predictable and innovative financing, including by meeting the goal of mobilizing 100 billion US dollars per year until 2020 to support climate action so that small islands may adapt to life in a changing climate. We must solicit support for SEEDS Compact that entails specific financial instruments in the short, medium and long term to help SEEDS meet the ongoing challenges of the pandemic, service their debt and increase their limited physical space. We welcome the G20's announcement of a common framework for debt treatments beyond the debt service suspension initiative. However, more concrete steps are also needed to allow vulnerable countries to reduce their debt burdens. One such measure could be the early implementation of the tangible proposals from the initiative by Jamaica, Canada and the Secretary General 
on financing for development in the era of COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, providing solutions to global crisis require global efforts, partnerships, and leadership. Addressing the unique challenges we face require solidarity and collective actions within this alliance. This is why, my dear friends, since the founding of EOSIS, we have worked tirelessly to promote the issues most important to SEEDS. We must, dear friends, continue our work and our united call for a transformative response to our unique challenges for the next 30 years and beyond. I thank you. Once again, SEDS lead. Aside from the countries you have just heard, Grenada has also just submitted the updated MDC. And we are now the most of any country grouping, with Marshall Islands being the first country in the world to do so, quickly followed by Suriname, Jamaica, Singapore, and Cuba. A further 16 SEDS are resolved to do so in 2020, and 13 more early next year, well in advance of COP26. And now, before we continue with our program, we would like to share some important messages from UN DESA and the Office of the High Representative for the Least Developed Countries, Landlocked Developing Countries, and Small Island Developing States, UN Ops. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, on the occasion of the 30th anniversary of the Alliance of Small Island Developing States, AOCs, I wish to congratulate you on your successes. AOCs represents a group of countries whose contribution to the world in resources, talent, and creativity defies their size. Countries facing real challenges, yet determined to overcome them with a resilience of a spirit and discipline. Excellencies, we would prefer to be celebrating this anniversary without the shadow of a pandemic. However, COVID-19 has strengthened our resolve to overcome these challenges and reaffirm our commitment to the Sustainable Development Goals and the Samoa Pathway. I extend my best wishes to our office for another 30 years of strong leadership and success. I thank you. Excellencies, colleagues and friends, I wish we could all be together in person to celebrate your milestone 30 years of working relentlessly for the people living in the small island countries and low-lying states. Today, I join so many others in warmly congratulating you for all the hard work, your dedication and perseverance shown. Your efforts, your leadership were instrumental in putting the special and I say complex case of SIDS squarely on the map. You were a key driver for reaching global agreement from the SIDS program of action to the Samoa pathway and those tied with the UNF triple C and indeed the sustainable development goals. Birthdays are a cause to take stock, to be proud in our achievements, but also a moment to look forward. Once again, we find ourselves at a key turning point and it is my strong conviction that EOSIS must continue to be a critical voice for the world's island nations on the global stage. All of us at OHR, LLS and myself, as your High Representative, will continue to be your strong and unwavering partner. The challenges ahead that we must tackle will truly take a village to do so. Let us work even more closely together. Let us be ambitious together. Let us support SID so that they can overcome the many impacts of COVID-19, can reduce unsustainable levels of debt, address the ever more urgent climate change impacts, and so that they can access the critical financing they need now for their inclusive and sustainable development. I'm confident that with genuine partnership with increased and more coordinated UN presence in your countries and by all working together, we can overcome the unprecedented mix of challenges before us. Once again, sincere congratulations for all already achieved and my very best wishes for many more fruitful and successful years ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind words. 
We now continue with our Talanoa format and turn to the critical perspectives of voices that have been marginalized for far too long. First up is Ms. Okalani Marina, a youth climate activist from Samoa and proud Pacific climate warrior. Only 18 years old, Okalani is the vice president of a locally based nonprofit organization called Lanu Laoava, which aims to empower youth to take part in climate action so that they can create a meaningful impact in their communities. I can't remember what I was doing at 18 years old, but it certainly wasn't anything nearly as impressive. Everyone, please welcome Okalani. Talo Falava, I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate the Alliance of Small Island Nations in celebrating their 30th anniversary. This is such a milestone and I'm so honored to be a part of it. So up until this point, we've been hearing some amazing people talk about where we've been and where we want to go. But that leaves us with the big question. How are we going to get there? And in order to answer that, we need to go back to square one. Five years ago, 197 countries got together in Paris and promised to limit the rise in global temperatures to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Since then, the United States has pulled out of the Paris Agreement and other countries are not delivering on their targets. Right now, we're already at 1.1 degrees Celsius and we're set to surpass our limit in the next 10 years. Even if every country achieved their target goals, the temperature would still rise by more than 2 degrees Celsius in the next 70 years. Which leads me to my main point. The Pacific is a collection of islands that contribute less than 1% to global greenhouse gas emissions and yet we are the ones at the forefront of this climate crisis and we're the ones facing its consequences in full. As a Samoan youth, my identity and culture is so deeply rooted in my land that the thought of it disappearing scares me. But. It is also that same fear that drives me to fight for change. Climate scientists suggest that this generation of children are among the last to know their homelands in the Pacific. If sea levels continue to rise at this rate, millions of people will be displaced. Thousands of cultures and languages will become extinct. As Pacific Islanders, our understanding of the world is founded on indigenous knowledge passed down to us from our ancestors and taught to us through stories and traditions by our elders. And this knowledge is the foundation of fundamental principles that we use to fight back against the climate crisis. These next 10 years will be the most crucial in ensuring our survival and it will be particularly significant for small island nations. Despite our different cultures, traditions, and languages, the one thing we all have in common as islands is that we're running out of time. The same ocean that unites us is the same ocean that threatens to drown us if we do not treat climate change with a sense of urgency. And this isn't an easy feat. It will take political will at international and national levels in order to truly make a difference. It will take legislation, litigation, and education to create change. This is why it is so essential that you give youth and indigenous people a seat at the table, and why climate action should be focused on indigenous communities because they have always been the protectors of the land. In order to combat climate change, we must have the desire to change our mindsets and our actions we need to focus our resources on grassroots organizations that are working at the forefront of this climate movement. We need to create spaces for youth and indigenous people to share their stories and experiences of resilience and strength despite being at the very front lines of this climate crisis. It is why as Pacific climate warriors, despite all the odds being stacked against us, we will continue to fight in order to ensure the survival of the next generation and our islands because we want the world to know that we are not drowning, we are fighting. Thank you, Okalani. And we indeed are running out of time and we are so encouraged by your youth leadership in climate action. 
and I think it's super important. And just to quickly interject for any other early career SIDS leaders, I would just like to highlight to stay tuned on the AOSIS website for notice of the 2021 AOSIS Fellowship Program. But now moving on to our next speaker, Mr. Clement Nyo Mulalap is a native of the island of Wakab in the Federated States of Micronesia. Among other things, he, is, he regularly covers the intergovernmental negotiations for multilateral environmental agreements on behalf of the Federated States of Micronesia, including the UNFCCC. He's also the co-chair of the facilitated working group of the United UNFCCC Local Communities and Indigenous Peoples Platform on where he is an inaugural SIDS representative. So let's hear from him. The fight against climate change cannot be won unless all stakeholders, all relevant and interested individuals and groups and communities are part of the fight on the front lines, hand in hand with the rest of the international community. Indigenous peoples and local communities are an important part of this fight against climate change. Indigenous peoples, by most accountings, although they make up about a quarter of the world's population, nevertheless manage about 80% of the world's remaining biological diversity on land as well as in the ocean. Local communities play a similarly important role, uh, being fisher folk, forest managers, livestock herders, and so forth, who are also intimately connected with the natural environment. In the Pacific Islands, where I am from, Although our government actions and policies and documents do not often reference explicitly indigenous peoples and local communities, there is an understanding that most peoples and communities in the Pacific are indigenous peoples and local communities, given our long-standing connections to the land and marine spaces that we occupy today. In recognition of the important contributions of indigenous peoples and local communities to the fight against climate change, uh, the, the Conference of the Parties to the UNFCCC has adopted and implemented a local communities and indigenous peoples platform, as well as a facilitative working group for the platform that among other things, allows for equal representation on the facilitative working group for party representatives, as well as representatives of indigenous peoples, with seven party representatives on equal footing with seven representatives for indigenous peoples on the facilitative working group, including uh, a set aside seat for SIDS, as well as a set aside seat for a representative of indigenous peoples from the Pacific region. This equal playing field and participation is a critical and long overdue recognition of a partnership potential that indigenous peoples and local communities can play alongside parties and governments in the fight against climate change. Drawing on millennia of traditional knowledge, of indigenous knowledge, of local knowledge about the natural environment, about how the natural environment has changed over millennia, and about how to adapt to such changes, as well as how to take steps to remedy and reverse such changes. All of these potential contributions are available in indigenous peoples and local communities, including in the Pacific. It is key that parties to the NFCCC continue to recognize the important contributions of indigenous peoples and local communities going forward as we embark on a monumental challenge over the next decade or two to bend the curve of climate change and make sure that we live a world for future generations uh, that is inhabitable, allows for prosperity, and continues the intimate connections to the natural environment that indigenous peoples and local communities have enjoyed through millennia. Thank you, Clement. Thank you, Clement, for your messages. And right now, we'd like to interrupt our programming just a little bit with an important message of solidarity from UNCTAD and from the FAO. So, roll the tape.
I congratulate the Alliance of Small Island States on its 30th anniversary. Your global engagement in favor of the most vulnerable on key issues like climate change, ocean conservation, biodiversity protection, and the sustainable development has led to the important outcomes, including the Samoa pathway. FAO is committed to support the seeds through the Global Action Program on Food Security and Nutrition, the Hand in Hand Initiative, and the dedicated FAO Office for Seeds, LDCs, and LLDCs. We will strengthen collaboration with the Alliance for Better Production, Better Nutrition, a Better Environment, and a Better Life. Ladies and gentlemen, happy to be with you today. Uh, it's true that the specific situation of the seeds is absolutely key and crucial. Uh, it's related to the socioeconomic situation, but also the climate change issue, how it, how it impacts uh, your countries. And it's why for a long time, UNCTAD uh, advocate and will continue to advocate for a specific statute and, and capacity for the, the seeds. I think that it's key in the next decade. Uh, it's why it's important today for me, uh, on behalf of UNCTAD, to congratulate you for this 30th anniversary. Thank you both for your kind words, and Ms. Durand for your advocacy of a special statute for SIDS. Now, for our 30th anniversary, messages and well wishes came from all across the globe, of which we are greatly appreciative. If we were to show you it in the entirety, it would take up the entire night. So at this juncture, we would just like to show you snippets of these reflections. First up are some reflections from our very own EOSIS member states themselves. Director. Small Island Developing States. We are beautiful but fragile, exotic but vulnerable, climate challenged but persevering. EOSIS has been at the forefront of the United Nations by defending issues of importance to small island states. An alliance that brought all of us together on the issues that threatened our lives and our livelihoods. An alliance that provided a strong voice for the easily marginalized voices of small island states. AUSIS has shown the world the power of small island states. The 30th anniversary of AUSIS is a source of pride and joy to our islands. We are not islands scattered across the wide ocean, since Iosis unites us in a common cause for achieving a sustainable planet for present and future generations. Iosis indeed embodies our island spirit. Over the last three decades, Iosis has become synonymous with advocacy, resilience, fearlessness. The strong voice that we need championing our issues. As a low-lying atoll nation, the continued support and advocacy of fellow island nations is essential to our future. Together, we have had and will continue to have an outside impact in shaping global action on climate change and sustainable development. I want to thank Ambassador Lois and her team for their sterling leadership. I also want to thank our previous chairs and their teams for guiding our work in the last 30 years. We also convey our support and commitment to Antigua and Barbuda as the incoming chair. Keep shining, keep rising, and we would indeed continue to deliver strong outcomes for the betterment of our people, of our planet. We are poised for the task ahead. Happy, Happy 30th anniversary. anniversary. Thank you so much. Beautiful messages and wonderfully said. And now some sentiments shared by the broader international community and from every corner of the globe. Let's hear from them. Ambassador Louis Young, Excellencies, dear colleagues. Today, I would like to congratulate the Alliance of Small Island States on their 30th anniversary. A 30th uh, anniversary calls uh, for reflection. 
just as it actually does for, for individuals when they reach the, uh, the tender age of, of 13. You know, many questions surface like, did we get off, uh, at the right, off to the right start? Uh, are we on the right uh, track? What actually uh, have we achieved and what lies, uh, what lies ahead? Hoy en día no se entiende el sistema multilateral sin la voz de los SIDS. For 30, For 30 years, years, 30 years, 30 years. Yes. you have been a leading voice in combating climate change, biodiversity loss and sea level rise. The Alliance has played a remarkable catalyzing role in successfully amplifying the voice of SIDS in their quest to achieve sustainable development goals and raising the ambition in the fight against climate change. La coalición ha sabido coordinar las voces de sus más de 40 miembros y enviar a la comunidad internacional un mensaje de alerta ante los graves desafíos a los que se enfrentan los pequeños estados insulares. IOSIS has indeed become a strong organization and you speak powerfully as a group here at the United Nations. You were advocates, you were pioneers, and you were above all leaders. You have enriched our debates around climate change, around resilience, around vulnerability, but also more importantly, you have been great champions for the, for the system of international cooperation and for the United Nations writ large. France remembers the decisive role played by the EOSIS during the COP21. It led to the conclusion of the Paris Agreement and contributed to make 2015 a historic moment for our planet. Today, thanks to the extraordinary work and dedication of the EOSIS, the ambition of the Paris Agreement remains unchanged. This is but one example out of many others of how EOSIS has been an important and reliable partner in multilateral diplomacy. Small island developing states walks the talk on climate change. You show us that what is needed is that we not only talk, but that we act. 2020 has been a difficult year for all nations, but it's been particularly difficult for SIDS. La pandemia provocada por el COVID-19 y los efectos sociales y económicos a los que se une el impacto que ya provoca el cambio climático y los retos del desarrollo. 2021 will be crucial, a crucial year for a green recovery. You can count on Poland's support. Qatar has a long-standing commitment to supporting our funds in the small island developing states. We attach a great deal of importance to working with uh, all of the um, the island states to be in solidarity with you, to continue to work closely with you, and to celebrate the the unique uh, cultures and the unique situations uh, that the island states have uh, uh, experienced. Indonesia deeply value our close partnership in advancing issues of common interest. Italy is, is a proud, long-standing partner of small islands development states. My country, the Philippines, stands in solidarity with AOSIS. Japan will work together with SIDS. The United Kingdom remains a close friend of AOSIS, and we're committed to continuing to work closely together to support inclusive and resilient recoveries from the current COVID-19 crisis. And to build back better. We know that we can all count on AOSIS. We know that SIDS are low emitters, but on the front line of climate change and the biodiversity crisis. We know climate change is for real. We know that we must trust science. We hope to continue our collaboration for many more years. Together, united, we are stronger. Only by working better together and as equal partners can we build a brighter future forward. I augur EOSIS another 30 years of successful endeavour in giving SIDS and other vulnerable states the opportunity to make their voices heard on the world stage. Please keep up your good work. The world needs to hear your voices. Congratulations. And wish you all the best for the anniversary and beyond. Happy birthday, EOSIS. Congratulations on 30 years of cooperation and powerful advocacy.
Happy birthday. Long may your success continue. Feliz aniversario. We wish you every success in the future. Congratulations on your 30th anniversary. Felicidades a Osis. Happy birthday, Osis. Warmest felicitations to the Alliance of Small Island States. Thank you for all of your important work and I wish you another 30 years of successful activity. Congratulations, AOSIS. Happy 30th anniversary. Congratulations again, and we look forward to continue our close partnership in the future. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. Yay. Where's, where's your glass, Brittany? <laughs> Happy anniversary, AOSIS. Those, those uh, super warm messages, and it has led us now to the end of our program. And it is time for the formal handover of the AOSIS chairmanship from Belize to Antigua and Barbuda. Minister Courtney, will you do us the honor on behalf of Belize? Minister. The period 2019 2020 was always expected to be milestone years for the Alliance of Small Island States. 2019, a milestone five year review of the sustainable development goals for small island states, an opportunity to infuse the next steps of our quest for more just, equitable, and climate secure societies with urgency and increased international support. And 2020, a milestone year for the global climate ambition agenda, with states self-directing new climate plans to set the world on target to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade and reach net zero emissions by 2050, if not earlier. While the epochal upheaval of COVID-19 casts a dark shadow over these milestones, their achievement remains imperative. This is because every credible scientific projection has all but confirmed that we have merely a decade to avoid dangerous climate change. They are imperative because our children and yours are woke to the dereliction and apathy of leadership and demand that their future should not be forsaken. We must act now because every day, every year, every degree matters. It matters for us, the small islands on the front lines, and for our children. It matters for you because ultimately, we are only as strong as the most vulnerable. The struggle is not ours alone. It is a global struggle. Together, we must fight for equity and for justice. Allow me to briefly acknowledge all those who have kept the AOSIS flame alight during Belize's chairmanship. The former permanent representative, Ambassador Lois Young, and deputy permanent representative, Ambassador Janine Felson, who worked tirelessly to support a successful chairmanship. I would especially like to acknowledge the team behind the scenes who worked seamlessly together. Our lead negotiators, Carlos Fuller and Sharon Lindo, who took on heavy agendas and tough political dynamics, but came through with historic achievements and platforms for the wider AOSIS membership to leverage in the future. The technical staff, Nelly Katzim, Margot St. John Sebastian, Diana Ruiz, and Brittany Main. The team coordinator who managed all AOSIS engagements and outreach, Ismail Sahir. The program director, Alfonso Gahona, as well as all our thematic coordinators in the climate change process. Climate analytics, islands first. An important feature of the chairmanship is strengthening the capacity of AOSIS members with a fellowship that was professionally led by Professor Bryce Rudick and assistant Sarah Savarini. We were fortunate to have a superb set of media coordinators from Dr. Tyrone Hall to Jabal Hassanili and Cindy Baxter. Because the backbone of the chairmanship is ultimately the mission, we must recognize the indispensable support of Andrew Smith, Charlene Henderson and Batia Darmandasa. Finally, none of this would have been possible without the support of the Ministries of Foreign Affairs, 
and the environment at home and the Caribbean community as a whole. It is now time for Belize to pass the chairmanship to another member of the Caribbean family, Antigua and Barbuda. Minister Green, I have every confidence that under your leadership, the EOSIS family will continue to see great success as we continue our journey. God bless you. Thank you, Minister Courtney, for that excellent wrap up of Belize's tenure at the helm. Ladies and gentlemen, I am very proud to now bring to the floor our new AOSIS Chair, His Excellency Ambassador Dr. Aubrey Webson of Antigua and Barbuda. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Chairman, Honorable Minister, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, colleagues. Before I introduce my Minister, foreign affairs, let me join the chorus of voices that, first of all, offer great congratulations and appreciation to the many presidents and chairpersons who led the AOSIS group, or I may say the OASIS movement over the last 30 years. Without your hard work, dedication, and your significant contribution by you, members of your team and your country, we would not have changed the world. I also want to specially thank my colleagues and friends from Belize for the stellar leadership they showed over the last two years. They have raised the bar and it is high indeed. And Antigua and Barbuda will do our very best to follow as we will continue to fly the flag of CARICOM. Colleagues, it's my honor and a real distinct privilege for me to introduce the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Trade and Immigration of Antigua and Barbuda under whose leadership we will work in following in the footsteps of our colleagues and friends from Belize. Honorable E.P. Chet Green, you have the floor, Honorable Minister. Thank you, Ambassador, Prime Minister Motley, colleague Foreign Minister, Belize, Eamon Courtney, other high-level dignitaries, ambassadors, esteemed diplomats. After 30 years, countless negotiations, what seems like unimaginable campaigns and real life experiences of the devastating effects of climate change on our small islands, one thing remains central to AOSIS, its identity of perseverance. It is perseverance that is at the very core, the very heart of who we are. And perseverance is what is needed to protect our natural habitat and guarantee the rebirth of Mother Earth. EOSIS began with a handful of men and women who were frustrated by the seeming silence of the international community and the ignoring of the plight of small islands and low-lying coastal states. As they sat in a conference room and assessed the world's environment and thought of ways to raise the voice of small island developing states in negotiations, one thing was clear. They needed to speak in one voice and to stand united. The tenacious efforts of those handful of men and women in that small conference room gave birth to AOSIS. And in the face of great adversity and through perseverance, we are still here today. It was their determination, courage and commitment, which demonstrated that a handful of men and women can bring together countries in ways never before thought possible. For them, it was towards a common goal of decreasing atmospheric pollution and the destruction of biophysical environment and for the protection of our small states. 30 years ago today, they started the process of changing the world for better. And here we are 30 years on, renewing our commitment to this existential cause. Make no mistake, 
even after 30 years, we are still facing significant environmental, social and economic challenges that threaten to radically alter the planet and all of life that calls it home. For EOSIS, the hope that we can collectively change the destructive course of the world is unflinching and necessary. Climate change is arguably the biggest global issue in our time. The Paris Agreement, therefore, must be seen as a major step to bring into force far more ambitious international action to hold us below 1.5 to stay alive and move us toward a safer environment. Connected to climate change is ocean acidification, which is already affecting marine life. EOSIS therefore must continue the fight for more marine protected areas, less illegal fishing, and stopping our oceans from becoming giant rubbish dump for plastics. The ocean is what 20th century connects us and is the economic engine for all of our countries. Never envisioned 30 years ago, we have expanded our fight for survival and SIDS and are vigorously trying to starve off an economic crisis that will impact all of our peoples and our ability to meet internationally agreed goals by 2030. Excellencies, the COVID-19 pandemic has caused a global pause and some say a global reset. But while the world is resetting, our countries continue to suffer and therefore correspondingly our fight continues. We have been fighting for the last 30 years from the Barbados Plan of Action to the Mauritius strategy to the Samoa pathway. One thing remains clear for SIDS and that is we will never give up. We might be small, but in Jamaican coined Caribbean shared lingo, we talawa. Today, as those men and women did 30 years ago in that small conference room, we accept and agree that we are the ones who can give voice to environmental, social, and economic issues and take action towards solutions. We have shaken many rooms before, sat at the table and raised our voices loud and clear, even at times when we weren't invited. We have done it time and time before and will do it again. For we recognize the health of the planet depends on the health of all of its parts, including its people. And there's no group of people better equipped to lead this planet away from destruction and back into restoration. We are the SIDS of this world. We are the conscience of humanity who acknowledge that with great leaders come big responsibilities. Let me here now salute Belize for so ably championing our cause for the last two years. The bar has been raised and new standards set, which Antiguan Bible commits to maintain. To Ambassador Young, Ambassador Felson, Carlos, Nelly, and Sharon, the rest of the OSC Secretariat, thank you isn't enough for a job very well done. We owe you an eternal debt of gratitude. As Antiguan Bible takes over the chairmanship on January 1, 2021, please, Your Excellencies, accept my assurances of a redoubling of our efforts in ensuring that the cause we all so adroitly fight for throughout these years will continue. Today, there's a greater urgency to protect our people, our small states and our planet. For another world, we know is just not possible. But the rebirth of Mother Earth is the only way. Consequently, from the shores of the Caribbean Sea, from the Atlantic and Indian Oceans, stretching across the South China Sea and the Pacific Ocean, through the arduous work of the past chairs of Oasis, Antigua and Barbuda will continue to fight for the preservation of planet Earth and for her rebirth. As we listen this evening, keenly to the stories from the past 30 years and to the lessons learned, please be assured that we take this charge given to us very seriously, because to put it simply, our lives, our people, and our countries depend on it. Happy anniversary, EOSIS, and I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Green. We know the legacy of EOSIS is in good hands under the stewardship of Antigua and Barbuda, 
as we step forward boldly in this decisive decade with renewed purpose. Thank you, Jabal. I couldn't agree more. Distinguished guests, we have now come to the end of our, of our proceedings. Thank you for taking the time to join us for this special occasion. We hope you enjoyed it. And a special thank you to all, all of those who worked so hard behind the scenes to make this event possible. Our many excellent speakers, Prime Minister Motley, Dr. Thomas, Kendall, Kathy for their wonderful poem, and those who contributed footage to the, create that video, such as UNDP, with some of that amazing aerial vi videography. All of our partner agencies who conveyed kind messages, as well as our well-wishers from missions all across the globe. And of course, a very special thank you to all of you here tonight who joined us, who took the time to log in and share this moment with us. We truly appreciate you. Have a good night or a day, wherever you are <laughs> in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone.